All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome back. Um, today, we are going to start discussing module eight, which is now uh, getting into turf grass maintenance. Uh, in the previous module, we went through uh, turf grass selection, installation, and uh, grow in. So uh, now we're going to move into the maintenance side, which is going to be pertaining more to the you know actual maintenance, obviously of new newly established turf, but also getting into um, turf that's well established and uh, been in the landscape for a while. So um, one of the first things that we're going to get into um, is going to be integrated pest management or IPM. I'm sure if uh, any of you have previous uh, uh, experience with other uh, programs, or uh, if you've been in this program for a while, I'm, I'm sure this isn't a new term to you. Um, but uh, it was relatively new when I started uh, going down this road with plant pathology about 20 or so years ago, 25 years ago. Um, I would not terribly new, but it was definitely becoming uh, widely adopted and mainstream. Uh, uh, in the mainstream industry uh, when I was uh, getting my foothold in this industry. So um, not a new term. Uh, it's been around for quite a few decades, but uh, definitely, uh, you know, pretty, pretty common today. So uh, I wouldn't be doing service to you guys if we didn't, didn't discuss uh, this component of management a little bit. So when we talk about integrated pest management, we are talking about uh, four quadrants of plant health. Um, so these would be your, um, you know, basically, you know, the, the foundation of what your program is going to be uh, built on. And uh, the first one is going to be cultural. So um, as you see, cultural would be at the bottom of the pyramid. It's the base of the pyramid or, or the foundation of the pyramid, if, if you will. Cultural maintenance practices are going to be things that include mowing and irrigation. Um, so things that you do, uh, you know, that, that uh, don't involve uh, physically changing the soil, don't involve, you know, any sort of biology or chemical inputs into the environment. Um, these are basically going to be your management practices. So your mowing heights, mowing frequencies, what type of equipment you're using, how you're maintaining that equipment. Also things like irrigation, uh, sunlight. Um, so those are all going to be part of your cultural um, approach. Next up is going to be, uh, you know, your physical uh, uh, practices. So this would actually entail physically changing the environment. So uh, you're going to be altering the environment, well, whether that means uh, thatch removal, it could, it could include practices like aeration, could be soil amendments, things like fertilizers, liming, sulfur treatments, organic matter, um, you know, physically removing, um, you know, trees or thinning canopy, improving drainage. All of these things would be examples of ways in which you would actually be physically changing that environment to make it more conducive to growing turf. So then the next one up, um, you know, would be uh, chemical, which would be pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, herbicides. You know, these would be the chemical inputs um, that we're putting in um, to actually mitigate some of these problems. And, uh, and then obviously biological. So um, biological would be uh, either biological inoculants or beneficial insects and microbes. Um, you know, ideally, we would try and focus on things that are going to promote, um, you know, harmony, biological harmony in the ecosystem, uh, promoting things like the soil food web and uh, making sure that we have uh, adequate populations of soil biology. Um, because in many cases, if we if we can keep the biological system in balance, then we're going to mitigate the need for uh, any sort of chemical input. So, you know, um, biological, if, if again, if everything is in harmony and nothing is out of whack, then we typically don't see a big influx of pests. Um, obviously, whenever we're growing a crop, 
uh, or a monoculture of a specific crop and we have a large area of it, we are obviously going to be inviting pests in. So um, we're never ever going to probably be able to eliminate some form of chemical input, whether it's organic or synthetic. We're probably always gonna have some sort of, of chemical input on these properties to keep them looking their absolute best. So integrated pest management is a holistic approach to turf care. It seeks to consider all aspects that play into plant health. So, and, and it's, it, it really focuses or centers on that old adage of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So uh, the prevention side is going to focus on promoting healthy plants that have fewer problems and can fend for themselves better. Again, if, if everything is in balance and that plant, that plant is maintaining optimal health, um, one of two things is going to happen. Either it's not going to be susceptible to a, um, an opportunistic pathogen to come in and attack it, um, where if it is under stress, on the opposite side, if, if a plant is under stress, it's going to be uh, more likely that it's going to be attacked by a pathogen or a predator. Um, the other thing uh, that we look at is that um, if we're maintaining optimal health in that plant, it also has a better chance of fending off attacks by pathogens or predators. So, you know, again, um, pests tend to target plants that are weakened by stress or that are uh, interestingly too healthy. Um, so when we look at insect and disease issues um, specifically, a lot of times are gonna be secondary to another problem. Either this, this lawn is too lush and too thick and too beautiful, meaning that basically you have too much lush, tender, su succulent growth, and that plant hasn't had an opportunity to allow uh, the, the, the foliage to basically, or other structures of the plant to kind of harden off. Um, and, uh, or on the other side, if the plant is too weak, if it's too stressed out, um, you know, then it also doesn't have the ability to produce the different components and compounds inside of it that are going to help it fend off an attack. So, uh, you know, when we look at integrated pest management, are we treating the symptom or are we curing the disease? Okay. And, you know, I know with COVID, we talked about this a lot. You may have heard this adage thrown around that, you know, is the cure worse than the disease? You know, and I, I think sometimes in, in uh, lawn care and, and turf management, we also run into the same situation. I mean, we can over manage something to the point that um, it's completely uh, a completely sterile environment. Um, this has happened in some cases. I, I can't uh, think of specifics, but I know just in my walk of life that there's been uh, situations with, say, universities where their uh, their main football field in their stadium uh, was completely sterile and devoid of any kind of um, pathogens. And so when they were looking at various different trials and things, they weren't able to successfully conduct them on some of these fields because they were so chemically overmanaged that they were completely devoid of any kind of um, biological life. So it may, again, imagine once you once you're kind of on that let's call it chemical dependency cycle uh what happens when you start to take the lawn uh or the landscape environment off of that chemical dependency cycle uh clearly it's going to crash clearly it's it's not going to be um acclimated to that that new kind of environment and you're going to invite problems to come in so it is uh, definitely a slippery slope uh, when we get into this chem chemical dependency life cycle in lawn care. Um, so another hallmark of integrated pest management is that it requires a management plan. So this isn't a passive or reactionary approach. It's more of an emphasis on prevention than cure. So, um, you know, one example would be if we're going in and doing, you know, regular calendar sprays or chemical treatments, that um, isn't necessarily a hallmark of IPM. There are situations where we may do some sort of a, uh, you know, a, a calendar type approach for preventative applications. 
Uh, but again, you know, that that's less focused on IPM. That's more of a of a calendar chemical approach. So that would not be a hallmark of integrated pest management. So um, even though we think, well, we're doing a preventative chemical application, you know, uh, it wouldn't re it wouldn't really be considered um you know, truly, I mean, it is preventative in the sense that it's mitigating the problem in the first place, but how do we really know whether or not we were even dealing with that problem or it was necessary to do that? So, um, you know, when we look at diseases specifically, um, you know, there's something that we refer to called the disease triangle, okay? And historically in, in models, we're looking at three components. Uh, we're looking at the disease, we're looking at the host, we're looking at the pathogen and uh, the environment. So when the pathogen and the host and the environment are all together, uh, when they all kind of align under the right circumstances, then we can get the onset of disease. Again, if we were going to do a preventative uh, fungicide application, we're basically circumventing this whole process. So we don't really know at that point whether or not um, we were going to see a uh, an outbreak or not we're just going to try and mitigate it all together um, so that would almost be synonymous like for you and i if we were just prophylactically taking antibiotics every day trying to prevent uh you know any sort of, of bacterial illness like pneumonia or something like that from happening well you know what happens when you stop taking the antibiotics okay you know, you've you've you basically wiped out all your good beneficial uh, microbiota that are in your body's you know biosphere, so to speak. So uh, there's going to be problems that result, you know, secondary problems that result from uh, from prophylactically taking it. And I guess that's what I'm getting to before, like where sometimes we can end up with almost like a sterile environment because we've used chemicals and synthetics so much to the point that we basically uh, render that environment completely devoid of, um, of uh, biology. And, uh, you know, a common situation that we see in human beings would be something called thrush. If any of you have kids uh, or have experience with kids, you may have run across this or you may have run across it yourself. Basically, uh, you end up with yeast infections in the mouth because oftentimes after taking antibiotics, it does such a good job of cleaning out your microbiota that it allows other um, opportunistic uh, problems to occur, one of which would be yeast in the form of thrush. The same thing can happen in our landscapes uh, you know, when we're overly dependent on these chemical inputs. So the goal is to try and, and move away from that kind of approach and get into more of a, uh, you know, use it if we need to kind of situation. So uh, there's a fourth component that uh, many times people don't talk about this, um, but being a plant pathologist, I feel like it's absolutely necessary to talk about this because, you know, we, we don't often think about it. You know, that fourth component is time. And uh, it's often overlooked. So yes, we need the plant, you know, or the host. We need the pathogen present. We need the environment, um, you know, uh, conducive, you know, whatever those environmental parameters are that, that are going to spawn that disease. We need all of these things present. But there's a fourth component that we often don't think about. You know, when we think about the disease triangle, it really should be called the disease tetrahedron because that fourth component that we need to think about is time. So all of these things have to occur together, but they have to occur within a given time frame. Usually there's so many hours or so many days of a consistent pattern of all of these things being together. Just because you have um, uh, high humidity for a day and just because you have uh, perennial ryegrass or or Kentucky bluegrass uh, in the environment just because it's it's 85 or 90 degrees uh, for a day does not mean that you're going to necessarily get pythium okay um, so you know we think about this just because we have certain things coming together doesn't necessarily mean that that problem is going to occur we need it to to these these conditions or parameters to remain consistent for a period of time in order for that to do. If we do see a favorable weather pattern or climate pattern, 
um, you know, in the forecast, that's definitely a situation where we may want to consider preventatively treating with a fungicide. Again, we don't always have to treat for a fungicide, but when these conditions come together in a disease, so to speak, um, that's a time where we may look at that, that, that forecast, say, yeah, I better get out there and put something on there to present, prevent that disease from occurring, okay? So um, another critical component that we see, uh, and this isn't so much necessarily with disease, uh, as it is maybe with insect issues, but uh, there's this concept of action thresholds. So this is another piece when we when we look at pathogens or pests in a, in a lawn care situation. You know, there are different action thresholds that we can look at before we make a decision. You know, a lot of times guys will call me and say, I found grubs on a lawn. You know, well, how many did you find? If you took up an area and, and that was damaged and you, you pulled back the turf, peeled it back and looked down there, did you do a grub count? And how many grubs per square foot did you find? You know, so, um, you know, we want to look at action thresholds. It might be, uh, you know, that there there's only four or five grubs under that plot of turf. That may not be enough that, you know, yeah, they're there. Okay, but there's always grubs in a lawn to some degree. Is it enough that it, it's something to worry about? So action thresholds need to be met before taking action. And so the presence of a pest doesn't always require treatment unless there's high enough numbers. So, for example, crabgrass needs multiple criteria met. You know, this is a this is a confusing one for a lot of guys. Here in, in March of 2021, today is March 31st, uh, forsythias are already in full bloom all over um, all over northern Ohio. So, uh, you know, you may look at it and say, oh, my God, I missed the window. Crabgrass is going to be germinating. And I often get this, especially when we have these early spring warm-ups. Well, not so fast, guys, because, you know, we need a few parameters to be met. Okay, again, when we think about a triangle, you know, um, we have to have more than one parameter met uh, in order for this to occur. You know, crabgrass is 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 no different. So, um, you know, the soil temperature day to night swing needs to be between 57 and 64 degrees Fahrenheit for four to five days in a row. So here we have a temperature parameter in the soil and we have a period of time, that time component, four to five days in a row. We need another component, air temperature. So we have soil temperature and we have air temperature. Um, we, you know, recently did this on one of the assignments I signed where you go in and you look at the seeding temperature parameters for um, turf grass. And again, for that seed to germinate, there's a couple parameters. There's a soil temperature parameter and there's an air temperature parameter. And if we don't have both of those pieces together for a certain period of time, whatever that germination window is for that species, it's not going to happen. Okay, so crabgrass is no different. So 57 to 64 degrees, four to five days in a row. Nighttime air temperature is 55 degrees uh, for a week. Okay, so at least five days we need to see nighttime temperatures no lower than 55 degrees. The, eight, the daytime temperature can be whatever. So we could literally have a period of time where the nighttime temperature is 55 degrees and the daytime temperature is 55 degrees. It's probably not likely to occur, but theoretically, as long as we held that for, for a period of a week, theoretically, um, crabgrass could start to germinate, okay? So uh, we also need adequate soil moisture. So again, have we had rainfall? Stick your finger in the soil. Is the soil bone dry? A lot of times in May, May can be very dry. It might be warm, but it may be dry. Um, the month of March here in 2021 has been particularly dry. Uh, we've been below average on precipitation. And so, you know, even though, you know, the, the parameters might be, you know, right for something like a crabgrass to germinate, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. There's multiple qualifiers or multiple parameters that have to occur. So um, a better a better indicator of um, germination is something that we use called the Growing Degree Day Calendar. Um, and the Growing Degree Day Calendar basically tabulates and keeps track of how many Growing Degree Days uh, we have in a given year. And so 
Typically for crabgrass, uh, we see a couple of different growing degree day indicators. One would be 211 for large crabgrass, and the other would be 263 for smooth crabgrass. So all crabgrass should germinate uh, by the time the soil temperature reaches 73 degrees Fahrenheit at a one inch depth. So if that surface level is, is, uh, is at 73 degrees, by that point, we know that crabgrass is done germinating. So any crabgrass that was there that was going to germinate is, is will have done so. Um, so that's kind of that stop point that we know that we're probably not going to see any further crabgrass germination. So, um, you know, uh, again, um, this is hopefully illustrating that, you know, uh, the more knowledge that we have about a given pest or a given pathogen, you know, the better we can accommodate for it and, and how we manage our approach. And ultimately, um, it comes down to being, you know, more sustainable and it's going to come down to, uh, you know, better cost management on the back end. OK, so IPM can really, if we use it successfully, can really help us manage costs. For example, with crabgrass, if we know that um, the growing degree days are going to be around 211 to 263 growing degree days, that can help us make decisions as far as like crabgrass pre-emergence that we put down, or even when we would maybe start mixing in a um, you know dimension or something like that in there to get early post control. It may also help with um, you know maybe we need to start going out there with some quinclorac. Okay, so um, you know just really you know knowing that kind of optimal window for when that's going to occur is going to help us to better plan and strategize when we're using these products. And if we if we can time it accurately, then we may be able to get away with a lower uh, amount of active ingredient um, than we would otherwise put down. So, you know, again, when we look at crabgrass, um, one of the old phenological indicators, again, a phenological indicator would be a plant uh, that's doing something at the time that maybe that pest would normally start to show up, okay? So um, historically, um, you know, we've always said try and get your crabgrass preventer down by uh, forsythia bloom or time it with forsythia bloom. Um, so this would be an example of a phenological indicator for the crabgrass pre-emergent applications uh, that we would want to get them down before the forsythia are done blooming. Okay, so and and again, you know, like I said earlier, uh, here in March of 2021, these these suckers are early. Okay, we had some really really warm temperatures. The soil temperatures actually did get up into the 50s, but again, they didn't stay there. Now we have a little bit of a cold snap, where you know, as we would expect this time of year, we're going to be going back down now. Realistically, uh, because this growing degree day clock has already begun. Could we potentially see crabgrass germinating? Yeah, we could. Um, if we get into another warm pattern and that warm pattern holds again, um, you know, we could pick the cycle back up again and we could see crabgrass germination uh, sooner. I will tell you that normally uh, in northern Ohio, I don't start seeing any widespread crabgrass germination uh, until about the middle of May, usually around, say, May 10th or so. Um, you know, and the earliest I've ever really seen it widespread germinating uh, is maybe about a week earlier. Uh, we could have one of those years this year, depending on if this weather pattern holds and it stays on the warm side. Uh, you know, we could see crabgrass germinating a little earlier this year than we would expect to. But fortunately, most of the contractors, most of the service providers, because we had such a nice mild, uh, dry March have really been able to be on top of things this year and get these applications down early. So integrated pest management is great, but what are some of the real world limitations? You know, so, you know, it's, it's a great idea, just like many ideas, it's great in conception, but, you know, the practice portion of it, when we put it into play, this is where we can start to run into problems, you know, in these real world circumstances. So, um, you know, especially if you're, say, a fertilizing lawn care company that has, say, several hundred accounts that you're fertilizing, you know, how are you possibly going to keep track of and 
know every single lawn that has this specific type of grass that needs this specific type of application. You know, it, it's just not always feasible in the real world when we put this in practice. So, you know, custom tailor, uh, custom tailored approaches to each property can be difficult when you have a large customer base. So again, knowing the nuances of every property and knowing, you know, and trying to cater a program to each one, um, you know, lawn fertilization companies may only be on a property once every five to six weeks. So again, you know, how are you going to be able to get on and actively manage this property and know what's going on? You know, and if you're maintaining a large number of properties, you know, it might be impossible to uh, manage a large number of them exactly the same way, um, you know, at the same time. So that's the other thing. So even if you could inventory your properties and say, I could do all of these, this and this and that, or I knew that all these properties had grub problem last year. Um, it's not going to be practical or feasible to get out there and do a large amount of acreage at the same time. We can try and, and manipulate the schedule a little bit and, and tweak things a little bit and take things out of sequence a little bit to try and accommodate for this, but it, it's really not practical, okay? The other problem is that if we're trying to go that approach in a commercial um, type setting, it can be very, very expensive. Um, because we're not going to be able to run our management practices at optimal efficiency. So that's going to create a lot of waste and that's going to create a lot of um, expense on the back end um, because of the labor involved and because of the lack of efficiencies involved. So um, IPM strategies tend to be better suited for institutions with dedicated maintenance personnel. So an example would be like Cleveland Browns or many of your golf courses. Um, you know, maybe if it's a large, you know, park type setting like a botanical garden or an arboretum, something like that, where you have dedicated personnel, um, high end estates sometimes have dedicated personnel, um, you know, and maybe some of your public school districts, you know, they may also have uh, personnel that are dedicated to some degree where you, you kind of have some flexibility to get out there and do what needs to be done. So there's a common theme here that I, I think you're probably hearing, which I keep saying, which is called dedicated personnel. Okay, um, so when you're not a production oriented or a mass production oriented company um, and you have dedicated personnel um, and you have the budget to afford to pay those personnel to maintain that facility, um, it can be a lot easier to run an integrated mess, uh, integrated pest management uh, program. So there are some best practices though that can be util utilized across the board. So just because we may not be able, if we're in a production or professional mode, just because we may not be able to integrate all of these practices in, in, our, in our businesses or our, our work environments, there are some take homes that we can get from IPM and we can use. One of these would be soil testing, okay? So um, this would focus on a preventative component where we actually go in and really gain an understanding uh, of the soil. You know, uh, one of the recent experiments I had you guys do for lab was the uh, jar test. And, uh, you know, that would be a perfect example, just even on that level to understand the basic soil structure of an environment and um, you know we don't necessarily have to do soil testing across the board um, but you know many of my clients do run soil testing when they run into uh, problem properties but you know we even focus on this on a new lawn installation it might be a nice thing to give that customer that that gift of, of knowing okay this is this is what's wrong with my soil and these are the the areas that I'm probably going to need to focus on and, and address on the maintenance side. So great, a great idea on a new lawn install, but uh, even on the maintenance side, something that we can employ on a regular basis uh, to help us out, okay? So another component that, that we can look at would be a good fertility program. You know, making sure that we're running a balanced fertility program, uh, you know, making, you know, use of good quality products and materials. Um, so, uh, you know, we might want to run different nutrient sources, like maybe some bridge products or hybrid organic type fertilizers, um, you know, 
focusing on slow release, it's going to carry that release period out over a longer uh, period of time and reduce rate, uh, reduce waste and uh, improve uptake efficiencies. Um, so another practice, uh, if we're in the mowing biz, is changing mowing heights and patterns. So, you know, as we're moving through the spring, maybe we raise that deck up and then we drop it a little bit each week as we go into summer. Um, just because, uh, you know, we we're trying to keep up with that peak growth or that surge growth and trying to make sure that we're not mowing off more than a third of the of the turf canopy per week. Again, that causes stress and that can cause injury and that can invite problems to come in. So, you know, maybe we we alter our, our mowing practices. Maybe we change our mowing pattern and we go in different directions. That way we, we're not necessarily training the grass to grow a certain way. Okay, so, um, you know, there's different things that we can do in that regard. Um, making sure that we're sharpening mower blades frequently, you know, this is a big thing that I see, you know, making sure uh, that we are uh, taking the time to keep these blades mowed sharp because, again, a good clean edge is going to heal much better than a rough edge on a blade of grass. And, and uh, if we have that frayed or torn edge on a blade of grass, Again, that's going to create an opportunity for pathogens to come in. It's also causing the turf stress. Um, you know, another IPM approach that we can employ in our in our in the chemical side of things is rotating pesticide chemistries. You know, uh, we don't have to use the exact same thing every time. Yeah, sometimes it's going to cost us a little more money, but I guess that depends on you know how married we are to being um, an environmental steward versus how married we are to our pocketbook. Okay, so um, this is something that that again we can look at and uh, you know work with with. Uh, you know, maybe our suppliers, uh, you know, different agronomists and people that that advise us to determine, you know, what are some options for um, different fungicides, different insecticides, different herbicides. Um, sometimes we can be limited in the lawn care side, especially on the turf and ornamental, uh, like residential commercial side, sorry, uh, versus say golf. Golf has a lot more options available uh, and, and then uh, say uh, residential and commercial turf, but still there's opportunities to rotate uh, chemistries to make sure that we're not setting up either for resistance or that we're not uh, necessarily overusing something. So, um, you know, another component that we can look at again is a reliance on preventative control over curative control. You know, here in the picture would be a crabgrass preventer. So, you know, one of the things we can do really easy is use pre-emergent herbicides. We can use them in our beds. We can use them in, uh, in the turf. They're relatively low environmental impact. Uh, they work at the source of the problem, which is the weed seed and preventing it from germinating. So using a product like this can prevent us uh, from having to use, uh, you know, maybe more toxic or more dangerous uh, curative chemistries later in season. So this is something that we can do, um, you know, on the turf side. Um, periodic aeration and overseeding every few years. This is another practice. This can also be an upsell for many of your clients. So, you know, why would we do this? Well, for one, we're going to remove thatch. We're going to open up that soil. We're going to reduce compaction. So this would be a physical change uh, through the aeration that can help improve that environment, that ecosystem. Okay. The other component would be the seeding. If we go in and do an overseeding, we're incorporating new genetics into that into that old lawn. We're in essence rejuvenating it, uh, giving it some new life. Um, and and um, so you know, again, these are areas that we can look at physically changing and also biologically through the form of um, uh, new grass seed being incorporated into the environment. So another component of, of IPM that we don't always talk about would be training and communication. So you can actually train your personnel, your team members to uh, be able to identify and report issues early before they get out of hand. You know, your mo crews that are out on that property every week can be great sentinels to be able to feed uh, information back to you. Um, you know, it just takes a little bit of effort to basically communicate with them. You don't have to necessarily give them a crash course at the beginning of the season. Maybe every week, 
you know, at the end of the week, you have like a brief crew meeting. You have everybody come back in when they're done with their day and you stick around or in that morning on Friday before they all go out. It's even better. Uh, and you, you do a cap and you look, you say, OK, here's you know, what's going on. You know, growing degree days are going to be in the range of crabgrass germinating next week. So, uh, you know, I need all you guys to be on the lookout and, you know, let me know when you're out mowing these properties. Make sure that uh, if you see any, uh, here's where you can look to start to see it. You know, it's really prevalent along your, you know, driveway, sidewalks, you know, curbs, you know, tree lawns, things like that. High, high uh, stress areas is, is probably where you're going to be most likely to, to, you know, see it. And, you know, if you could report back to me, that way we know and I can get my, you know, applicator people out there to take care of it before it becomes a big problem. So that would be one example, you know, but this can work on many things, insects, diseases, you know, even just telling them if you see areas of grass, it doesn't look like it should report it back to me. You don't have to necessarily diagnose it or know what it is. You just know that it doesn't look right. If you see something that doesn't look right, report it back to your crew leaders or your account management people, whoever's in charge. Um, you know, that way somebody can get out there and assess it before it gets out of hand. You know, so um, another component uh, that even if we're in a production capacity, uh, if we're fortunate enough to be able to break away and do more of the QA type stuff, getting out and, and you know, kind of uh, handholding some of the clientele, um, you could make individual service recommendations when necessary uh, by offering additional add-on services to address problems and improve that property for the customer's benefit. So you're going to do two things. You're going to increase sustainability and you're going to reduce um, pesticide usage. You're also going to put some more money in your pocket, okay? So um, this is an opportunity for you to go out and basically say, you know, hey, Mrs. Jones or whoever, were you aware, you know, that uh, you might have this issue or you might have this concern or maybe we can go out and, and sell you on that aeration overseed um, or, you know, could we maybe do a soil test on your lawn and make sure like, you know, that there aren't any things that we're missing, uh, you know, so you're going to create opportunities to maybe still give that client that custom tailored personalized feeling, um, but you're not necessarily, you know, ruining your production uh, capacity of your company. You're not having all your production guys going out and doing all these one offs. Um, so again, it, it allows us the ability to do some personalization of service. Uh, you know, if we can get out there either ourselves or if we have somebody that we have as kind of a QA type person that can go out and make these individualized recommendations. So um, aeration overseeding or slice seeding, maybe with an endophyte containing Tuaca certified tall fescue variety. Okay, we talked about Tuaca and the benefits of Tuaca. You know, this is something that, you know, we're going to do that. You know, we're going to kill multiple IPM birds in one stone. You know, we can physically change the soil structure by increasing pore space, reducing compaction. You know, slice seeding can also remove thatch buildup. You know, uh, you could also verticut, you know, existing turf, you know, would be another example, basically a very similar process to the slice seeding or dethatching. Um, you know, and then the use of improved turf type tall fescue variety is going to be a biological intervention. OK, again, we're introducing a new biological component into that environment uh, to improve the overall results. So, again, you know, these are things that, you know, are integrated pest management type strategies that we could employ uh, bits and pieces of this. You know, maybe we can't employ the entire uh, program, nuts and bolts, all in, all, all in one uh uh, in one uh, approach, but we can take, you know, kind of, I guess, cherry pick pieces and parts off of this mindset to uh, to use to the benefit of the, uh, the client or the property, okay? You know, another component that we can look at um, that's becoming more and more prevalent is hybrid organic lawn fertilization programs. So um, I run a lot of these. I create a lot of sustainability-based uh, programs for many of my clients uh, where we focus on actually trying to um, build the soil up with uh, organic uh, components and also maybe directly inoculating the soil with uh, beneficial microbial populations. So 
You know, this all focuses on this idea of the soil ecosystem or the soil food web uh, and, and, you know, things that we can do, um, you know, that are, are going to improve that soil. Um, so, you know, um, you know, a lot of times the analogy that I use with my clients when we develop these programs is, um, you know, it's like uh, McDonald's. OK, so I could, uh, you know, I could uh, I could, you know, eat McDonald's. I could live on McDonald's every day. Um, you know, I could go to McDonald's and I could buy food and I can eat it, you know, but at the end of the day, am I going to be getting every single nutritional benefit out of that, um, you know, that happy meal every day? Um, probably not, you know, it's probably not going to be the same as the quality of food and the quality of nutrition that I'm going to get if I went to a higher end restaurant, um, you know, say like a macaroni grill or, uh, you know, cheesecake factory or, you know, the farmer's table or something like that, or even going to like, say, a Trader Joe's or, you know, Fresh Time or something like that, buying, you know, um, you know, uh, better quality ingredients. Uh, so, you know, the idea is, again, you know, you can feed uh, lawn, you know, that McDonald's type approach where we're basically just relying on those synthetic inputs, synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, all that. We can chemically manage that lawn. It's kind of like, you know, a patient being in the ICU and hooked up to all the machines. We can keep that patient alive uh, on, on all those chemicals and, and drugs, medications and, and whatnot, you know, all those interventions. And we can certainly keep a lawn alive doing the same thing. But, you know, like I talked about a moment ago, what happens when you end all of that? Let's just say something changed and, you know, we're not going to go that route anymore um, and we or we can't afford to. That lawn or that, you know, that lawn ecosystem is going to crash, okay? And so that's why I always, um, you know, I try to advocate guys using uh, more organics and biologicals and things like that because, again, you know, we're trying to to create an environment that to some degree can sustain itself. It's an artificial environment, okay? We're never going to ever get away from, com you know, completely get away from uh, using some forms of chemical inputs, okay? But, you know, we can, we can definitely minimize it. We can reduce it. Uh, and, and uh, you know, do, you know, one of the big ways that we do this is just by overall improving that soil health. So this is a big a big piece of it that we can do. Um, the other thing that we can use are there's other technologies that we maybe normally wouldn't consider like wetting agents and soil conditioners. So these, you know, these are chemical products, okay? They're, they're chemically, uh, you know, they're, they're produced, you know, chemically in a, in a factory. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, chemically, they're chemical molecules, chemical compounds. However, um, they're not chemically working on the soil. They're not chemically changing anything in the soil. They're actually physically changing the soil. So, you know, they either are going to help retain moisture in the soil, you know, by absorbing it and then releasing it over time, or they're going to help that, that water penetrate the soil, especially in a situation where we have a, um, uh, a hydrophobic soil or soil that's been dry for a long period of time, like in the summer. If you can imagine the soil dries out and then we get that heavy uh, downpour at some point and unfortunately we're going to um, you know probably lose a lot of that water to runoff because that soil is crusted over it's become somewhat hydrophobic and that water is not going to be e be able to easily penetrate into that uh, into that soil so you know that's another way that we can um, you know, uh, effectuate a physical change in the soil, but we're using a chemical, in essence, a chemical or chemistry, uh, you know, to effectuate change would be the use of these soil conditioners, wetting agents or soil penetrants. Um, you know, so, um, you know, maintenance best practices is another component on the maintenance side. So again, you know, our mowing heights, mowing frequencies, um, keeping those blades sharp, changing mowing practices, um, you know, so, you know, are we maintaining that property, you know, I, you know, the best way that we can, um, are we, um, 
you know, uh, you know, are we maintaining that irrigation system properly? Are we watering it appropriately? You know, and you know what I mean. Are we doing deep and frequent waterings versus are we, you know, syringing the thing off a couple times a day every day through the summer? So, you know, what are are we doing as far as a maintenance standpoint? Are we employing, you know, the best possible practices we can? Um, so. Uh, the next component that we're going to get into here, I'm going to try and break this up a little bit so we don't get too long winded in each one of these and give you guys a break. Um, but the next uh, component of this moving into, you know, maintenance or management practices is going to be getting into the mowing equipment specifically. So that will conclude this uh, part of the um, of the uh, discussion.